So let's pray. Father God, Adonai, we thank you so much for this time to come before you. We thank you for the privilege and the honor to be able to declare and decree your word. May your word go forth unto the nations. May it call those who are hidden in places of darkness to be brought out into your marvelous light. May your word penetrate the, the fetters, the, the chains, the bondage of sin and cause people to be liberated and free today. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pray that you're blessed today. Once again, we're starting this series titled, You Are the Light of the World. Let's jump right into our message today. As we're going to be looking at it from a Hebraic perspective, maybe you've never heard of it before or heard it from a different perspective. Well, today, I pray that you'll hear it from a different perspective with ears that would hear what the rock, the spirit of the living God would have to say today. Amen? Because we know that the Bible was not written to a Western mentality or Western understanding or Greek understanding but was written to a people, a specific people, who understood the culture in which they lived in and understood the arguments and the idioms that were spoken in that time, day, and age. So therefore, hopefully we can shed some new light on this as we look into the scriptures today. Turn with me again to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 18 as we begin. The scripture says, you are the salt of the earth. Did you catch that? You and I are to be the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing. Listen to me. You and I are called to be useful in the master's hand. We do not want to become ineffective and good for nothing. But listen to what else it says. But to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Now verse 14 is going to be the catalyst and verse 16 of what we're going to be talking about and going and branching out to as we proceed. Verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. Now, understand who he's talking to. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to his Talmudin. He's talking to you and I. Today, you are called to be the light of the world. I am called to be the light of the world. Listen to what else it says, because it's very, very important that we understand what he's saying, because he's saying that we are to be distinctly different. We're called out of darkness into the kingdom of light. So you and I are to reflect the very image of God. If you would really pay attention, this goes back to the book of Bereshit, the book of Genesis in the very beginning. If you recall, the state of the world at that time of the earth, the heavens and earth was chaos and darkness was covering the earth. So we understand that in, in the beginning he said, let there be light. And then we see something very extraordinary happening in chapter 1, verse 26, where he begins to say, let us, Elohim said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So you and I are to be the image and the likeness to reflect just as God reflects. So therefore, it, it, it behooves us to grab a hold of what Yeshua said when he said, I am the light of the world. But now in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he's saying, you, I, we are the light of the world. Let's continue on. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Did you catch that? You and I are called to shine before men. And the purpose that we are supposed to shine and reflect the image of our Creator is so that they may see our good works. Now, let me pause for a moment here because good works is not about us earning salvation because there's no amount of works that we can do to earn salvation in fact works is done so that men can see it and be pointed to God the Father see we ought to understand that salvation is a free gift it, it is by grace through faith that we are saved and not by works but let's look, continue on with the correct understanding you and I are to be the light before all men that they may see our good works and glorify our father which art in heaven so let's take a pause for a moment if you and I 
are acting just like the world, behaving just like the world, with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, how is it that we are being distinctly different? How is it that we are reflecting the image of God? If we're on the job site and we're cursing and we're carrying on and, and we're gossiping and we're complaining and we're backbiting and we're doing everything else that everyone else does that's in the kingdom of darkness, how is it that people will see a night and day difference in our lives. How is it that they will be drawn to the light if you and I are blending in as spiritual chameleons with the world? Listen to what verse 17 says. Verse 17 continues on in the same thought. Yeshua is saying, Think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. In other words, I've not come to destroy the Torah or the Nevoim. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Let's, let's dig a little bit deeper here, because I'm sure that many of you are listening today have heard the fact that the law of God is done away with. The reality is, is that this is an erroneous teaching. And in fact, I would go so far to say that people who are articulating, who are teaching and preaching this, are misunderstanding scripture. Now, Let's give a little bit of understanding because, once again, as I said, we're going to look at this from a cultural perspective, a Hebraic perspective that was understood in this time, this day and age. So we ought to first understand that this is a Hebrew idiom that rabbis spoke to, them, to one another, and this is, in fact, a rabbinic argument. To say that I've not come to destroy simply means, as an idiom, it simply means this, that I've not come to misinterpret the scriptures. But when he said to fulfill it, he's saying, I've come to give correct interpretation. So in other words, Yeshua, Jesus was saying, I'm not coming to misinterpret the scriptures or give you what I think it means. I'm giving it to you as the Father gave it to me. Do you remember what Yeshua said? I don't come speaking my own words, but only that which the Father has spoken. He only did what the Father did, only spoke what the Father spoke. Now listen, verse 18 says, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot nor tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So, what we have to understand here is, and we have to ask ourselves a question, is heaven and earth still existent? If you were to look outside right now, do you still see heaven and earth? You do. So guess what that means? That the law, God's instructions, God's directions for our life, the pathway to holiness, to being sanctified, to be kadosh unto God, and the, the words that were written to the prophets, the Nevoim of God, are still relevant for today. So with that understanding, let's jump a little bit further into our following Texas. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 through 13. Let's read what it has to say. It says, for you are his workmanship. Who's him? Who is this making reference to? It's making reference to Adonai, God the Father. For we are his workmanship, created in Yeshua HaMashiach, Christ Jesus, unto good works. Listen, did you catch a hold of that? You and I are created in Christ Jesus as his workmanship unto good works. Once again, you and I are to operate in good works remember the purpose we just read in matthew chapter 5 the purpose is so that men will be drawn to the father let's continue on for we are his workmanship created in yeshua hamashiach unto good works which god hath ordained that we should walk in them wherefore remember that you being in time past now he's speaking about us who did not know him in times past we who were outside of the covenant of God in times past were Gentiles in the flesh. Wait a moment. We must grab our understanding of Gentiles. What does it mean to be a Gentile? And I've taken this passage from a website called BibleStudyTools.com. And we ask the question, what are Gentiles? And in the Hebrew, it is the word goyim, meaning in general, all nations except the Jews. 
In, cor in a course of time, as the Jews began more and more to pride themselves on their particular privileges, it acquired an unpleasant association as it was used as a term of contempt. So when you were called a goyim, a Gentile, it was looked at with a negative connotation. And in fact, we'll talk about this in further depth because it was very, very a negative thing to be called a Gentile. In the New Testament, it is the word Hellenist, which literally means and, and denotes the concept of anyone that is a non-Jew. So we understand that a Gentile is someone that is a non-covenant person with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So let's continue on as it talks about, again, in times past, you and I being considered Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision of flesh that's made by hands. That at that time, you were without Christ. Did you catch this? When you and I didn't have a relationship with God the Father through Christ Jesus, you and I were considered people who were without Christ, being aliens and foreigners from the commonwealth of Israel. Did you catch that? What is this commonwealth with Israel? Well, what is a commonwealth? We must define this. Strong's number 4174 says that a commonwealth is citizenship, the rights to be a citizen. In other words, what God is saying is that when we come to him and we come into relationship with him, when we didn't know him, now we, through the blood of Yeshua, are brought into relationship with Christ, with God the Father, and no longer considered aliens or strangers, but now we are considered Israel, that we would have rights to the kingdom, rights to the promises, rights to the covenantal promises, that we can now have hope, because we are considered the people of God now. And the people of God and the covenant people of God are known as Israel. Now let's continue on. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promises, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Yeshua HaMashiach, you who sometimes were far off are brought nigh by the blood of Christ. Did you catch that? One of the purposes of why Yeshua died on the cross, on the tree, was not just for the forgiveness of sins, but it was for reconciliation of the people back to the Creator God, so that we can be considered citizens of the kingdom and covenantal promises being known as Israel. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Did you catch this? I want you to grab hold of this because it's necessary that we understand this. We have had to renounce, meaning to turn away, to teshuva, to turn away from the things of this world, from the deceitful ways, from dishonesty from walking in craftiness, deceitfulness. And notice what it says. And even handling the word of God deceitfully. People of God, we have to understand that this is the last days. We are, in fact, living in the last days. Even as it says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 5, that many will come in his name, claiming that he is the Christ, but shall deceive many. How it also says that in the latter times that many will begin to turn away from the faith. Why? Because they're going to take heed to the different spirits, to different voices and teachings and doctrines that are being taught. Listen, by seducing spirits, the scripture says, by doctrines of demons. You and I have to understand that if there are those that are handling the word of God deceitfully, it must mean that there are those who are handling it correctly. The problem is, is that sometimes we are not discerning enough, nor have we studied enough, nor have we done the work of being a Berean, Berean to test whether or not what is being said is in fact scripturally and culturally accurate. So with that being said, let's continue on. 
but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them who are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. Did you catch that? That the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. In other words, that the God of this world, being Hasatan, Satan, the prince of the power of the air, and the kingdom of darkness the, over those who are the children of disobedience, he has the legal right to blind the minds of those who do not believe. In other words, before you and I were believers, we operated in this same kingdom and were blinded to the truth of the gospel. But now that you and I come to Christ, our eyes have been opened. This reminds me of Paul on the road to Damascus when he was zealous for the things of the law, as scripture says. But let me take a moment to clarify. When it talks about Paul being zealous for the things of the law, we must learn to differentiate that there are two types of law, not one, but two types, two main ones. And the two main ones are the word that is written, the law of God that is written that we can find in our scripture, and the law that is considered rabbinical law that the rabbis and modern day Judaism teaches that is above the written word of God. In other words, it is man-made traditions and man-made laws that they hold on to to be superior than the written word of God. So we got to understand that Paul sat at the feet of Gamiel, and he, Gamiel, was known as one of the greatest rabbinical teachers. So when the scripture is talking about Paul being one who was zealous for the things of the law, he was talking specifically about the things of the rabbinic law, that does not necessarily line up with the written word of God. So, with that bit of understanding, let's continue on. So it goes on to say, Who is, lest we be the light, what he's called us to, is that the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine onto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake, in God, whom commanded the light to shine out of darkness, have shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, in a very important passage of scripture we can find in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 5 through 7. It says, Thus saith God the Lord, Adonai, he that created the heavens and stretched them out. He that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. Sounds like creation. I the Lord have called thee, who's he called? His people. He's, I have called thee, verse 6, in righteousness, and I will hold thy hand, and I will keep thee. God is a keeper. God says he's called us to righteousness. He'll take us by the hand. He'll walk with us through every situation and circumstance in life. Listen to me. As God was faithful to take the children of Israel out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of bondage, out of the place that represents sin, God himself, as he took the children of Israel, even in the darkest time, and he was what? A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God was saying that I am the light. Listen to what he's continuing on to say. Not only am I calling you to righteousness, not only will I take you by the hand, but I will keep you. And I give thee, you, a covenant of the people. What's the purpose of him giving us the covenant? For a light, the scripture says, for a light of the Gentiles. Once again, we just talked about Gentiles. Gentiles are anyone who are non-covenant people with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What is the purpose of us giving this us, the people of God, the covenant? That we would be the light. So here we see the purpose of being the light. Not only that people would see our good works and be pointed to the Father, but it is very specific to open blinded eyes. To bring out the prisoners from prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison houses. Now listen to me. I believe that healing takes place today. 
I believe in miracles. I believe that the Ruach of God can move miraculously. But I want to take us to a deeper level of understanding. Because we have to understand that when we did not know God, when we had no hope, when we didn't come to Christ and our eyes were closed and we were blinded, we operated as children of disobedience under the power of Satan. But the reality is, is that when we come to God and, and we have a purpose and, and we are called to be the light, and what happens is, is that blinded eyes, we are called to be the ambassadors for his kingdom. We're called to be his hands extended, to be and do the work that he has done. But here's what he says. You and I, as being the light, are to open the blinded eyes. Now, to open blinded eyes means simply like Paul. Paul, whose eyes, he was scales on his eyes where he could not see. But when Yeshua showed up and gave him a greater revelation as to who he was, the scales began to fall from his eyes. There are people who are blinded by the God of this world. There are people in this world who are bound in prison cells by sin. The greatest issue that we are facing in America and in the, every country throughout the world and every nation is not an epidemic of AIDS or, or, or any type of social economic issue or, or, or anything of that nature. What the biggest issue that we are facing in these end days is a three letter word and it's called sin sin is the greatest enemy to the things of god and god has called us to be those who are opening the blinded eyes how do we specifically do that by sharing the gospel message by allowing god's word to be the light that it's called to be that we are shining as his light and drawing people out of darkness into his marvelous light bringing those who are in prison out of their prison cells listen i know we're not naturally talking about the natural prison system. There are many people who are in prison system, but they don't need to be imprisoned. See, the real thing is, is that so many people are imprisoned by the sin that they're in. Sin causes people to be bound. And it is in these places that God has called you and I to go into the dark places. It's called you and I to pull those out of the clutches, out of the hand of the enemy, because he has them blinded for so long. You and I are called to bring the gospel message to all nations, to all people, wherever they may be, and share the good news of Yeshua HaMashiach to all people, that the eyes would be open and taking them out of their prison cells and taking those who are down beaten, trodden in depression, bound by the fetters of the enemy, bound by the chains of the enemy in sin and darkness, and bring them out of their places of prison and bring them to the house of Adonai. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, 11 says this, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partakers of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, which was given us in Yeshua HaMashiach before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus the Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, who hath ab abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Did you catch that? He is considered a teacher of the Gentiles. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7 says this. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. Now, I've got to pause here because there's a great misconception that many people will say, well, Paul no longer dealt with the Jews. He no longer dealt with the people of the covenant of God, but now he turned from them to the Gentiles. Well, we've got to understand something, that the Bible says that it is to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. Everywhere Paul went on his journeys and his missionary uh, journeys throughout the world at the time, he always went to the synagogues 
and then to the other people. We see this all throughout the book of Acts. We see this all throughout the journeys where he went to the people that were considered covenant people and then to those who were considered non-covenant people. Let's look at this because there are many who believe that this message is only for the Gentiles and thus the teaching that says that this message is only for the considered dispensationalism that it also ties into this that says that this is only for the church age and then what God does is he later turns back to the Jewish people but I'm going to tell you and show you scripturally that this is not so let's look at the book of Acts chapter 10 let's look at this starting with verse 9 and let's read together through verse 28 so Acts chapter 10 verse 9 it says on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city Peter went up unto the housetop, onto the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they were ready, they were making themselves ready, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending onto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of the air. Now listen to what it says in verse 13. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But listen to Peter's response. Listen to what he says. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is considered common or unclean. Did you catch a hold of what Peter said? Peter was someone that grew up in the culture. He was a Jew. He was someone who understood the scriptures. So in other words, he understood what was being asked of him because this now contradicted the written word of God. Now when something contradicts the written word of God, we must ask the question, is it something new that God is trying to say? Well, the reality is, is no, it's not something new. It's not a new revelation or insight because God is not going to tell us something contrary to his written word. After all, God is the God who changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. With that understanding, we have to understand what he's saying here. So again, let's go back to 13 to get a bit, a bit more context. And there came a voice to him saying, Peter, rise, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Where did he get this whole common or unclean from? Well, Leviticus chapter 11 tells us specifically what's considered clean and what's considered unclean. What's holy and what's considered profane. What's considered to be eaten and what's considered not to be eaten. What's considered food and what's considered not food. Now, with that understanding, verse 15. And the voice spake unto him again the second time. What God had cleansed, that call not thou common. Now this is where most people will stop and they'll read this. And most people will teach that, hey, it's okay to eat whatever you want now. I can eat pork. I can eat bacon. I can eat shrimp. I can eat lobster. And I can do whatever I want now. See, but the reality is, is that this passage of scripture is not a proof text at all. For us to say as covenant believers to say that we could eat whatever we want because Peter had a problem with this now let's look at this a little bit further verse 16 says this was done three times three times and the vessel was received up again onto heaven now Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen would mean now at this time it says behold the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry into Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the spirit, now watch this. Now the spirit comes to confirm because you got to understand Peter just doubted what the vision meant. It was like he was wrestling with what was being said. So. Let's look at what the Spirit revealed to him. And Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit, the Ruach of God, said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Do you think that there's a coincidence here that three times the vision was given to him and there are three men now at the door? I believe God was trying to give us a little bit of insight 
and point something out to us here. Let's continue on. These three men are at the door. Verse 20, Arise therefore and get that thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherewith that you have come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that fears God, and of good report among all the nations of the Jews, has, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words from thee. Very important. To be sent to his house and to hear words from him. Then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and his near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Let's stop right here for a moment. This all contextually, what is this boiling down to? Did you catch what he said in verse 28? Peter says, you know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. Now, we can understand the word nation is also a word that can be interpreted as goyim, amongst the nations, anyone who is considered a non-covenant person. Now, when we grab a hold of this, this will make great sense. Peter is not talking about the written law of God here. He's talking about the rabbinical law. The rabbinical law teaches that anyone that's considered a goyim from the nations, that is not covenant people, that you're not even to sit down and have a meal with, that you're not to have any contact with. In fact, it was taught that if you touch them, you were considered unclean yourself. So we got to understand that in order to understand this, we must understand the culture of the time. So what Peter was saying that is taught in the rabbinic teachings, the rabbinical law, that it is unlawful for a man that is a Jew to have company with someone that is of the nations, a non-covenant person, a goyim. But listen to what the revelation is here. The second part of verse 28 says, But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Did you grab a hold of that? Do you see this? This is so powerful that God was trying to tell him, don't you call any man unclean or common. He wasn't talking about food. He was, in fact, talking about man. Don't you call any man and don't you allow the rabbinical law to supersede my purpose and my plan. Because my purpose and my plan is that all men will come to know me. My purpose and my plan is that is this gospel message is for whosoever will. So it doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your culture. It doesn't matter at all. The gospel message is for you, you, and you. No matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. God is calling you. He's beckoning you onto relationship with him. Do not believe the lie that this gospel message is only for the Jews. It's not just for the Jews. It has always been about a people that will keep the covenant. Glory be to God. Imagine if Peter didn't grab a hold of this message and did not hear what the Spirit of God was trying to say. See, this man, Cornelius, and his household and the Gentiles that would be affected after this, the people, the men from the nations, would have never received the gospel message of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua HaMashiach, and the power of God onto salvation. Why? Because there were rabbinic laws that had to be torn down and that had to be brought down low 
and let God's word arise. See, this is why scripture says, let God be true and every man be a liar. See, the problem is today is that so many of us have been brought up in denominations. So many of us have been uh, really listening to our most favorite preacher and teacher. But the reality is, is that's all good. But is our, our denominations lining up with the word of God? Are our denominational truths lining up with the Word of God? Are the doctrines and the teachings of those denominations lining up with the Word of God? Are our favorite preachers, teachers, evangelists, televangelists, are they lining up with the Word of God? If they are not lining up with the Word of God, that Word is to be rejected. We've got to understand that the Bible says in the last times that there will be many that will be proclaiming that they're speaking for Christ, but in fact are not speaking for Christ, but they're actually going to be speaking from a different spirit, being deceptive, mishandling the word of God, who are actually influenced by the kingdom of darkness instead of the kingdom of light. And they, in turn, will deceive many. Let's look at the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28 as we come to a close for this section of our kingdom download message, You Are the Light. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. Yeshua came to them, being his disciples, his Talmudin, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, here's the commission that he gave to his disciples, that he's given to you and I today the same message, that you and I, to go and make disciples of all nations. Did you catch that? Yeshua said that you and I are called to go and make disciples, not converts, but disciples of all nations. In other words, of all peoples, of all tribes and tongues, and of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, catch this, and teaching them what? Teaching them to obey, to shema, to hear and to obey. Teaching them to obey everything. I need to emphasize this. I need us. It is quintessential. It's imperative. It's crucial. It's fitting that you and I grab a hold of this, that he's called us to teach everyone from the nations, teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. In other words, what did Jesus, what did Yeshua teach his disciples? What were the teachings of Yeshua? What did Yeshua do? Those are the very things that we need to be doing today. And it goes on to say, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Listen, people of God, you and I here today, God has given us a commission. He's called us to be the light of the world. He's called us to make disciples of all nations. He's called you and I to go teach all people from every background, tribe and tongue, to obey everything that our master, that our king, that our savior, Yeshua, has taught his people. If you and I today want to be the light that God has called us to be, you and I are called to be separate, to be the light, to come out of darkness, and to be people who proclaim the gospel message and bringing those who are blind into a place that they can now see. Those who are in their prison houses, out of their place of bondage and sin, out of their places of prison, and into God's marvelous light to take those that were sitting in their places of darkness to begin to give them hope who saw no hope. This is the job that you and I have as being the light of the world. Well, shalom, and may God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance unto you, and may he be the God that you serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's pray. Adonai, we thank you so much for this section of our teaching on You Are the Light. God, I pray today that somebody will be drawn by your ruach today to a greater understanding of what it means in your word to be the light of the world. That, God, I pray that even as we continue on in our second series of this message, that you will bring further uh, conviction, further understanding to the truth of the word of God. So we 
Thank you, God, for teaching us your ways that we could be your disciples. In Yeshua HaMashiach's name, we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you until we meet again in our second session and many, many more teachings to come. I pray that you have been blessed. Shalom.